Good morning and welcome to Mission of Grace Church. I'm Pastor David. We welcome you this morning in the name of God our Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord has given us a beautiful day to worship Him this morning. And we do so through this means. We are blessed to be able to do these things. And we come together, even though we are socially distanced, we are spiritually connected. And so we want to come together in this way to send up worship to the Lord and to be edified by the preaching and teaching of the word. Let us hear the words of the psalmist this morning from Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Amen. Now we are blessed if we are ever in the presence of the Lord in our hearts and minds, singing his praise, exuding his praise at, throughout our day, throughout our lives. We don't want to go very long without thoughts of the Lord. And so this morning we pray that things that maybe you have neglected, you may start to think about again. And we ask the Lord to help us. So let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, may, Lord, you help us this morning as we worship you. Help us to do so truly in spirit and in truth. We pray, Lord, that you would work in us and through us. May everything that is done this morning redound to your praise. May we be edified in that process. And Lord, may your people be encouraged and instructed. These things we ask in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. I hope you sing along to these next two grand hymns of the church. Love 
passing moment Strength I find to me in my trials here Trusting in the Father's wise bestowing I've no cause for worry or for fear Ease your heart is kind Last Wednesday, we were pleased to resume our Wednesday night service at 7 o'clock via Zoom. And it went very well and was well attended, I think. But one of the things that it's great about the Wednesday night service is we're able to hear um, more prayer requests and pray more freely for those prayer requests. Today, given the very um, public nature, global nature of the Internet, we are a little more general, but um, let us go to God in prayer. Let us join our hearts together, not only for our temporal needs, but also for our spiritual needs. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you afresh in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, needing you desperately. Father, we pray that you would deliver us from indifference from lethargy, Lord, from slothfulness and laziness, from preoccupation and self-absorption. Oh, Lord, help us to be engaged with you at all times. Help us, Lord, to be part of the church, for we are the church. We pray, Lord, that we would be living out the gospel each day, that we would be living out the faith. Lord, that we would not neglect the means of grace that you have given. We pray that we would meditate on your word, that we would pray, Lord, and that we would fellowship 
and give and worship and serve. Help us, Lord, in all these things to be faithful. And Lord, may we not waste this crisis. May we use it as an opportunity for spiritual growth. And may you grow each and every one in the grace and knowledge of you. May you meet the needs of every heart listening, whatever they may be, whether they may be temporal, whether they may be spiritual. We pray, Lord, that you would meet the needs of every heart. Help us, Lord, to be obedient unto you. Help us, Lord, to listen to your word. Help us, Lord, to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Help us to realize that we are in union with you. And so we pray for precious people, for those, Lord, who are having financial problems and problems where they're living. We pray that you would give them provision, that you would give them peace, that you would give them protection, Lord. For those who mourn for the loss of loved ones, we pray that you would comfort them and lift them up. Give them the peace that transcends all understanding. For those that are anxious, O oh Lord, may you give them courage and may you give them patience. For those who are in harm's way, we pray you would protect them, Lord. Keep them safe. Keep them healthy. For those who are ill, may you give them health and well-being. Father, we pray for each and every one, whatever the need, that you would meet it through your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Lord, we are yours and you are ours by virtue of what you have done on the cross. Father, we want to live for you in this age. We want to live lives that would exemplify you. We want to live lives that would uh, bring honor to your name, not lives of mediocrity and lives of procrastination. Those good things that we mean to do, may we do them, Lord. May we be people that look intently into the word and do not forget what the word says. Above all, Lord, may we love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And may we love others as we love ourselves. This we ask in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Now it's time just to make mention of remembering for tithes and offerings. The needs of this church continue during this remote ministry. And there's a couple of ways that you can remember to give, either by visiting our website, missionofgracechurch.org, or mailing directly to 358 Pleasant Street, Gardner, Massachusetts. passage this morning is Romans 4 18 through 25. Hear now the word of God. In hope he, Abraham, believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told. So shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, 
fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. The Word of God. What would you say is the most urgent need of the church today? What should be our priority? Perhaps it is knowing God and knowing God better. And how do we know God? How do we know him better? Prayer. Prayer. Biblical, spiritual, persistent, expectant, intercessory prayer. Do you pray for people? Do you pray for your family? Do you pray for your church? Do you pray for your country and your world on a regular basis? We must start by asking God to give us more love for people, more love so that we would consistently stand in the gap and intercede for them. A weed needs no help to grow. As I've told you before, my 14 foot straight as an arrow weed, now probably up to 16 feet, is doing quite well with no intervention. But the weed is no help to me. It's a hindrance. It's noxious. I can't eat it. If I were to grow a tomato plant, it couldn't reach a height of three feet without being staked and suckered fertilized and cared for. The point is, it takes effort to bear fruit. And it takes no effort to slip into sin. God moves, but he clearly commands us to pray and to pray without ceasing. The Bible says we have not because we ask not. We are in trouble at the moment. Fall and winter may bring even more of it. And the urgent need of the hour is prayer. For we need God to intervene and to help us. We need the mercy of God at this hour. What kind of prayer do we need? Effective prayer. The kind that avails much. The Bible says the fervent, effective prayer of a righteous man avails much. And the Lord in Jeremiah 29, 13 says this, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. John Bunyan said this, prayer is a sincere, sensible, affectionate pouring out of the heart or soul to God through Christ and the strength and assistance of the Holy Spirit. For such things as God has promised, according to his word, for the good of the church, with submission and faith to the will of God. Number one, faith is essential to prevailing prayer. Prayers without faith travel no farther than the ceiling. Jesus says this, Have faith in God, truly I say to you, Whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you received it, and it will be yours. Mark eleven twenty two through 24 Faith is essential to prevailing prayer. Our great example from the scriptures is Abraham, so much so that he is called the father of the faithful. Abraham believed against hope in hope. Abraham believed God. Some just believe in God, but do not believe God. Abraham believed God. One word in faith is better than than a thousand prayers without faith. 
William Grinnell said this, There must be an act of faith exerted in prayer, as well as the habit of faith dwelling in the person. Abraham's faith was not exemplary due to his own strength, but because of the object of his faith. The object of his faith was God. Now we all have faith, but where do we place it? If you place your faith in thin ice, you'll fall every time. If you place your faith in God, you will not. Abraham grasped two massive concepts about God. First, he understood that God gives life to the dead. At that time, there had been no recorded resurrection. And although God had not revealed any doctrine of resurrection, Abraham believed in God's resurrection power. And this was borne out with his obedience, raised, raising the knife above Isaac. He knew that if Isaac died, God could resurrect him. Second, he saw God as a God who calls things that are not as though they were. You see, God creates. He creates ex nihilo, that is, out of nothing. And this is a majestic thing. God creates out of nothing. Now, Abraham's faith had two great obstacles. One was the biological obstacle. Here, he and Sarah were very advanced in years, and people that old don't have children. And the other part, the other obstacle was the immensity of the promise that not only would these old folks have a child, but that the descendants they would have from this child would be as numerous as the stars in the sky and as numerous as the sand on the beaches of the oceans. What an immense thing. But the Bible says this, Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. It was so incredible, but he didn't vacillate. Birthdays came and birthdays went, and yet Abraham did not waver in his belief. The greatest obstacle was overcome by the facts. Sometimes we think faith is purely devoid of facts. Not so. How did Abraham come to this massive exercise of faith? Well, certainly it was the gift of God, but think about the logic of it. On the one hand, Abraham weighed his human impossibility of becoming a father. On the other hand, Abraham weighed the impossibility of God breaking a promise. God cannot lie. He cannot break a promise. And so the scale was certainly tipped that Abraham knew that when he stood on this promise in faith, God certainly would bring it to pass because God does not lie. Now, sometimes we get shaky about that because we know people lie and people break promises all the time and we become disappointed. But God breaks no promises. And so this morning, think about yourself. Do you know the promises of God? Have you written them down somewhere? Do you have a book, The Promises of God? Many people have compiled the promises of God from the Bible and put them in books. Those are good books. And so the question is, do you have a big God or a small God? Because the God of the Bible is a big God. And if you have a big God, you know that you can pray big prayers based on the promises of his word. What God promises, he will bring to pass. And we are to pray that he will bring them to pass. And hope against all human hope, 
self-desperate I believe, faith, mighty faith, the promise sees, and looks to that alone, laughs at impossibilities, and it cries, it shall be done, wrote Charles Wesley. Faith is essential to prevailing prayer. Number two, to pray in faith is to pray in accordance with God's will as revealed in God's word. Somehow we get the idea that we can just pray whatever we want, whatever we feel like. Um, you know, Lord, give me a million dollars right now. And when he doesn't, we, you know, are sad or upset or someone says to us, well, yeah, you prayed it, but you didn't have any faith. Um, no, the guardrails of prevailing prayer are the promises of God, his will set forth in his word. We must pray the word of God. The ancients did that. They prayed the word of God. What a wonderful thing to pray the word of God. Abraham was praying the word of God. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Now in Abraham's day, that promise was oral. In our day, those promises are written down for us. What a blessed day we live in. And to believe that which we have received through promise is to be fully persuaded that God is able to do what he promises to do. To pray in faith is to pray according to God's will as revealed in God's word. Don't forget it. God's word and his will therein is the rule of our prayers. We need not and should not wander or veer off those ancient paths. The hymn writer said it well, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. It is impossible for God to break a promise. How could Mary believe the announcement of the angel Gabriel? who told her that she would bring forth a child. She said, How? I have never been with a man. Gabriel said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. The angel was not talking about the power of men. He was talking about the author of the universe. With him, all things in this world are possible. And Mary, she said it well, let it be to me according to your word. O oh Lord, may it be to us according to your word. Satan has never performed a miracle in his existence. He doesn't have the power to perform miracles. All his attempts at miracles are counterfeits because he does not have the power that God alone possesses. The one whom Abraham believed is the God who creates out of nothing, who can bring something out of nothing, who can bring life out of death. Prayer. Praying for God's help, we should be reminded of a specific promise that God has made. Fix our eyes upon it. Put our faith on it and in it and say to God, I believe you. Help my unbelief. Increase my faith in this promise. I'm trusting you, Lord. Here I go. And then to act on the promise. Beloved, we walk by faith and not by sight. We not only walk by faith, but we live by faith. How do we do this hour by hour, day by day? We do it by reminding ourselves of the specific promises of God 
and resting and relying upon them. That's how we serve. For all the promises of God find their yes in him, that is, in Christ. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. When you realize that amen and yes mean the same thing, here's what 2 Corinthians 1.20 means. In Jesus Christ, God says his yes, his amen to us through his promises. And in Christ, we say our yes, our amen back to God through prayer. Prayer is always through the Son to the Father. It's through Jesus. God's yes comes to us in Christ. So if God's yes comes to us in Christ, then prayer must go to God through Christ because nobody, of course, wants to hear a no. Everybody wants to hear a yes when they pray. And that is what we hear in Christ and nowhere else. That is what we mean when we say, in Jesus' name, at the end of our prayers. Prayer is for God's glory. And all prayer should have the glory of God, ultimately, as its aim. Amen is our yes to the glory of God. Prayer is laying hold, laying hold to the promises that he makes. It is drawing on the account where God has deposited all his promises. Prayer is not hoping in the dark that there may be some God of good intentions out there. No, prayer goes straight to the bank and draws on the promises of God. Faith in God makes folks great optimists, gives people great courage. Many years ago in Burma, Adoniram Judson, the great missionary, was lying in a foul jail with 32 pounds of chains on his ankles, his feet bound to a bamboo pole. A fellow prisoner sneered at him, Dr. Judson, what about the prospect of the conversion of the heathen? His instant reply was, the prospects are just as bright as the promises of God. You see, even in the low circumstances, in the hard times, the promises are bright to us. I think it's kind of funny that at the beginning of this pandemic, everybody was quoting Psalm 91 and standing on Psalm 91. That's a beautiful thing. But where are they now? I don't hear much of it. But we should pray Psalm 91, shouldn't we? Number three, we must pray for submission and obedience to God as we pray. Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you received it and it will be yours. To believe that we received is to pray for obedience, to submit what God decrees. Job said it well, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, with prayer, praying the word of God, we have great contentment and peace. Like Job, we pray that we would accept what God wills as what is best. Stephen Yule made these observations. Think about this in terms of your spiritual maturity. When God wills sickness, sickness is best. When God wills weakness, weakness is better than strength. When God wills reproach, reproach is better than honor. When God wills poverty, poverty is better than wealth. When God wills persecution, persecution is better than peace. When God wills valleys, valleys are better than mountaintops. When God wills death, death is better than life. Beloved, we all struggle 
to accept this, and we must do so only through prayer. The exhortations of the Word of God, whether they come through your meditation of the Word or come through sermons, can only be affected with the power of God and us praying for the power of God. Now, when we just read what we read, we are acknowledging the sovereignty of God in all things. And remember this, remember our natural inclination. Spurgeon said it well. He said, men will allow God to be everywhere, but on his throne. That is, when God is doing what you want, oh, God's great. But when things are going not so well, or we say that we need to change and to be in accord with God's way, we get upset, don't we? A lot of times, the first person we look for is the messenger, the preacher, the pastor. We go after them because we don't like what God says. But God says what he wills. We must believe it, obey it, live it. It is witchcraft to think and act like you can control God. There is a dangerous movement in the church it's called the Word Faith Movement. It grew out of the Pentecostal movement in the late 20th century. At the heart of its doctrine is its belief in the force of faith. That is, they believe that words can be used to manipulate the faith force and create health and wealth. Laws supposedly governing the faith force are said to operate independently of God's sovereignty and that God himself is subject to these laws. A person can speak their desires into reality. Beloved, this is dangerous. Nothing short of idolatry, turning our faith and by extension ourselves into God. We are not God. The word faith movement is deceiving countless people. I remember my late mother-in-law being captivated for a time by the word faith movement. She was in pain in the evening, so she would listen and watch uh, late night TV. And a lot of times the word faith preachers are on late at night. And of course, they told her, if you give this money, you know, if you buy this prayer cloth, if you buy these things, God will give you back, um, you know, three times, a hundredfold or whatever it is that God would have to do this. He would have to give you it back. And so you invest the seed, give us the money and you'll get a bunch more from God. It's funny, but there's only really one place in the scripture that I know of that wealth was promised for worship. And uh, it was Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. It's the only place in the Bible, as far as I know, where material wealth and prosperity were offered in return for worship. However, the offer was not made by God. It was made by the devil. In other words, it's perfectly accurate to say that the claim worship and you'll be wealthy is literally a message from the enemy of our souls. God does not give us everything we want so we can spend it on our lusts. Obviously, Sometimes prosperity is adversity to people, and adversity is prosperity to people. Only God knows best. And we must pray that we would submit our hearts to him and how he deals with us and obey his will as expressed in his word. God brings adversity to us to grow us spiritually. As you may know, I've 
had open heart surgery. I've had eye surgery. Those two surgeries were very, very difficult. They strike at the, something very deep in a person, the heart itself and the eyes. Very, very difficult. But that is the way God works. How about Paul? Paul had a thorn in the flesh. He didn't say exactly what it was, but he had this thorn and he prayed three times that God would take it away. God didn't give him wealth. He didn't give him health. But he said to him this, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul said, I will boast in all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, with the word faith movement, the world has crept into the church. Human selfishness has crept into the church. There are well-meaning, beautiful people that believe those doctrines, but Lord God, may you release them. The church of Jesus must be a praying church. This is the hour for us to pray. I pray that you would join us on Wednesday nights via Zoom and pray with us. We probably had about 15 people last Wednesday, but that's a little short of an entire church, especially when you consider that I think at least three of those or four of those people were visitors. Where are the rest of the church? Beloved, we advance by retreat. The church is an army which marches on its knees. May God forgive us for becoming too busy during this pandemic and preoccupied and self-absorbed or indifferent, perhaps, getting into routines which are not good, which are not healthy. We need to pray without ceasing. I need your prayers. You need my prayers. We need each other's prayers. We need each other's encouragement. We must pray in faith according to God's word, not without a promise and not against a command. Calvin said this, Faith grounded upon the word is the mother of right prayer. Finally, we must pray with a fervent and forgiving heart. There must be fervency in our prayers. That is desire. Can you imagine if you prayed with somebody and you said, okay, let's, let us pray. And you prayed with them and you heard, and there was just a lackluster lack of fervency. You would say, wow. Where's your heart? Do you even want what you're asking for? Do you even know the great promises of God? Cool hearts, cold hearts, utter words that fall flat. How about unforgiveness? Do we really think that if we're harboring unforgiveness against someone else, that God is going to hear our prayers. God has forgiven us of so much, and yet we won't give just a little iota of that forgiveness to another person. I was driving up to the church yesterday on the highway, and, you know, I was just trying to be gracious that, hey, if I was in the left lane on Route 2, I wouldn't be one of those persons that would just stay in the left lane no matter what. Or even when someone, you know, cut into 140 and did so at the last moment, I wouldn't speed up and make it extra hard for them. I would hold back and give them a break and be gracious. We must be gracious people, forgiving people, forbearing people. 
If we regard iniquity in our heart, the Lord will not hear us. We must be forgiving with our spouses. We must be gentle with them. Men, listen to me. Be gentle with your wives. So many times we run afoul of this. We become these task-oriented people and, you know, we come in or whatever and start barking out orders. But we must be gentle with our wives. And if we're not, there'll be consequences to our prayer life. We must pray fervently for spiritual strength. We must pray fervently. We must pray fervently for spiritual needs of the body. Think about some of the things that Paul was praying for. He writes this prayer. This is the style of prayer. This is the kind of prayer we need to pray. And you can pray it today by praying the word. Listen. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, he's praying, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named, that, according to his riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, in your heart. We talked about that last week. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Listen that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Beloved, that's not praying for a hangnail. That's a big prayer. That's a spiritual prayer. That's a biblical prayer. Pray it. God's love is boundless. It doesn't have any bounds. Its length is without end. Its depth is without measure. Its height is without limit. May God give us divine desires. That is, may we want what God wills. Amen? Once there was an old man and he was down by a river and he was running a boat across it, bringing passengers back and forth. He was known as a godly and wise man. and People would go to him with questions. A young man went one day and said, Sir, can I ask you a question? How, how do I know God? How do I know God better? Can you help me, sir? And suddenly the old man was great strength, took the young man and plunged him under the water and held him down under the water with all the strength that the old man could muster. And the young man had to fight with all the strength that he could muster just to get up out of the water and catch his breath. And as he caught his breath, he said incredulously, Sir, why, why, why would you do that? The old man said, young man, when you want God as much as you just wanted a breath of air, you will find him. God says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Amen. Now the odds in this present age are that everything just goes down. Gravity is the prevailing rule of the day. There are many who are just perishing today. There are many in the multitudes, there are multitudes in the valley of decision that will never decide for Christ. And remember, if you're not with him, you're against him. There are men and women who've been blinded by the wiles of the devil 
and the gospel is veiled to them. They can't listen to the word of God preached. They can't read the Bible. They have no desire to. They don't understand it. The gospel is just words to them. When I was a young boy coming up in the church, the gospel didn't mean a thing to me. It was veiled. I didn't know what Jesus was hanging on the cross for. But in 1979, someone began witnessing to me and the Spirit of God came, regenerated my heart, called me to himself, and the things that I had heard about a little came to light. I saw the glory of the gospel in Jesus Christ. I pray that you do too. The gospel of grace is a bright, shining sun, brighter than the noonday sun. And so, beloved, if you believe the gospel, believe it more and beware in your prayers by limiting God, by praying outside of his promises and outside of his will. Remember this, expect the unexpected. He can do above all more than we ask or think. I love the... Um, Narrative in Acts 12. Before I talk about that, let me say this. It's a reflection of A.T. Pearson, and it's so true. We need a revival today. Do you realize that? There are so few souls coming into the kingdom of God. A.T. Pearson said this. There has never been a spiritual awakening in any country or locality that did not begin in united prayer. I pray that you would begin praying fervently. I pray that you would meet us at Zoom on Wednesday nights and start praying fervently with us. Now back to Acts 12. Think about what was happening. Peter was kept in prison and the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The church was brought to its knees by this desperate situation Peter was placed under heavy security, being guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Get that, 16 people. This was their usual Roman practice, changing guards every three hours through the 12 night hours to assure maximum security. He kept him in chains so he would not be able to influence others. Peter had sympathizers, though. Continuous prayer, meanwhile, was being offered by Peter by the church at Jerusalem. And while they were persevering in fervent prayer during what, in Agrippa's attention, was to be Peter's last night on earth, their prayers, unknown to themselves, were receiving an effective answer by God. Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. That Peter could sleep, sleep so soundly before his trial is perhaps indicative of his calm assurance that he was in God's hands. God sent an angel in answer to the prayers of the church. Thomas Watson puts it this way, the angel fetched Peter out of prison but it was prayer that fetched the angel. Suddenly, the angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up, said, Quick, get up. And the chains fell off Peter's wrists. The angel said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals. Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of prison but he had no idea what was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them by itself before there were electric gates, and they went right through it. When they had walked the length of one street, the angel left him. 
Peter was rescued. He went to the church at Jerusalem and knocked on the door. A servant girl named Rhoda answered and said, Wow, Peter's here. Hey, everyone, Peter's here. They kept right on praying. Peter, you're out of your mind, they told her. We should keep insisting that it was Peter, and there was Peter outside. It must be his angel, they said. Rhoda's excitement at hearing Peter's voice makes her forget to open the door and let him in. And those inside cannot believe that their prayers have been answered. Rhoda must be crazy. Peter's out in the outside of the door. He could escape from prison, but he couldn't get into a prayer meeting. The answer was not recognized at first due to small expectations. Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. When our faith is weak, our expectations and prayer will be small. Remember, without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Expectation is a crucial part of dynamic prayer, beloved. As the word of God says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we love you, Lord, and we give ourselves to you. We pray, Lord, that the words of your word would be etched upon our hearts, that we would live them, that you would work them out, Lord. Work into us that which is your will. And may we lovingly submit, obey, and pray for your will to take place in these days. In Christ's name, and all God's people said, Amen. The title of this next song is Pray. I hope you listen to it carefully and worshipfully.
And now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen and amen. May you have a blessed Lord's Day today and hopefully we'll see you soon, maybe this Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. God bless you all.